He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The ascension of Jesus is not much mentioned in the New Testament. It's affirmed in the book of Acts. Then you don't find it elaborated. Nevertheless, the creed singled it out. Forty days after the resurrection, he ascends into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty in the heavenly community. Christ, who is God from all eternity, who in Bethlehem was born on earth as a man, now returns to the heavenly places from which he came. But heaven is not a place. Heaven is a level of reality. It's not a point in geographical space. The creed is using picture language, which is what we have to do when we are speaking of things that lie beyond our present experience, beyond our present comprehension. In the Bible, the language of heaven and earth work in a very different way, that heaven and earth are the two interlocking, overlapping spheres of God's reality. God made heaven and earth not upstairs, downstairs, but like a different dimension of present reality. And the point of the ascension is that Jesus, still as a human being, still as an embodied human being, has gone into God's space, God's dimension of reality. And the point about that is that one day the two spheres of reality, the two dimensions, will come back together again. The veil between them will be removed and heaven and earth will be one. And in talking about this language of ascension, the creed is saying that wherever God is, Christ has gone to be with him. But, and this is the vital point, he does not return in the same state in which he was before the incarnation. He returns to heaven, to his place with the Father, in his human body. So the incarnation, if you like, is unending. The ascension doesn't mean that he somehow lays aside his manhood. It means that he takes his human nature, our nature, into heaven. His sacrifice, if you like, is accepted, okay? It is approved. He is the conqueror. He sits down on the throne. He has done the job, okay? Our salvation is accomplished. Calvary was the great victory day. It was the the day that ensures the ultimate end of this great warfare between good and evil. So he sits at the right hand of God. He has equal power and he can carry out all of the things that is the will of the Father because his will and the Father's will are one. And by that they mean that Jesus brings God to us. He shows us what God is like. He makes it possible by his resurrection to relate to God, but also that he mediates us to God. In effect, he pleads our cause before God. And that's one of the reasons why Christians may have confidence that they can know that their Savior and their Lord is pleading their cause with God at this moment. The Christian understanding from the earliest days was that Christ would return at the end, at the consummation of history. In the last clause of the second paragraph about Jesus Christ. It says that he will come from heaven to judge the living and the dead, the second coming. It's actually quite a fundamental part of New Testament belief. A very high proportion of the chapters of the New Testament contain some other reference to the return of Christ. Jesus himself said, I will come again. I'm going away, but I will come back. People can be very blind on that. It is something we have too often forgotten. And yet it's there running all through the New Testament. That's where the creed gets it from. Jesus promised his, it to his disciples that the day would come when he would return in glory and take his own to himself. A Jew will often say, you, you say, well, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they'll say, don't be daft. 
when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will bring peace. He'll bring pre peace. There will be justice. Jesus comes and he starts talking about the kingdom already present with Rome still in the driver's seat, with nothing changed. Look in the world today. Do we see peace? Do we see justice? Uh, obviously we don't. What's going on here, you see? There's the first coming of Christ, but that's only half the picture. And Jesus talks about you know, his parable of the wheat and the weeds. And, and the wheat are the sons of the kingdom, the sons and daughters of the kingdom. The weeds are sown by the evil one. And Jesus says they grow together until the harvest, until the end. Jesus gives an image not of this age, age to come, but of that age to come of the kingdom breaking in. In his life, in ministry, the kingdom has come. The, the Pharisees ask him on one occasion, when's the kingdom come? Where's the signs? And Jesus said, it's already in your midst. He's already here. When we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, do we really reflect what that means? Of course, the kingdom of God is already at work among us, but we are praying in the Lord's Prayer for the full revelation of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus changes the picture. You might, you might take that, that, that uh, you know, Jewish straight line, and Jesus does this with it. He overlaps it, and the kingdom is inaugurated in his life and ministry, in the incarnation. And now, the kingdom life, you see, the citizens of the kingdom live right in the midst of the citizens of this age. Or in John's vision, the citizens of New Jerusalem live in the midst of a fallen Babylon world. And so in that sense, the Jews are right. The Jews are awaiting the Messiah, and so are we. The Messiah is yet to come. The universe had a beginning. It didn't just happen. The last word of Scripture says, the universe is going somewhere. History is not blind chance, random. It's moving to end, to climax, to fulfillment. God is going to bring it all together in His time, in His way. We mean not merely a spiritual coming, we mean actually an event in history. And this is what the Second Coming is about. The early Christians expected the Second Coming of Christ to occur very soon in their own lifetime. From one point of view, they were wrong because 2,000 years have passed. The Second Coming has not yet occurred. But from another point of view, they were not wrong. Even if the Second Coming of Christ is delayed in clock and calendar time, yet from a spiritual point of view, it is always near at hand. Luther made a very interesting comment. He said, if Christ is going to return tomorrow, today I will plant a tree. <laughs> in other words, what he was saying is that my responsibility here and now is to get on with life and the duties God has given me, which is not sitting down trying to calculate the hour of his return when Jesus said he himself didn't know that, but to get on and be faithful and to live here and now. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus.